Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, answering your listener questions today. How do you reward your child for a good school report card? What about the long-term durability of a real estate income stream? Are we in a housing bubble? What should I do, pay off student loan debt or invest first? Should I get a home inspection? And what's the one thing you should do before you buy any property that you're probably not doing? All today and more on Get Rich Education. Finally, with Total Control Financial, get checkbook control of your existing 401k and IRA funds to invest in real estate. Yes, you can move your retirement money into your own checking account, but you must avoid the little-known tax that you'll get hammered with in a self-directed IRA. Instead, start your QRP. Learn more and get your free copy of the QRP book by text messaging QRP in all capital letters to 72000. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, from Colombo, Sri Lanka, to Columbia, South Carolina, to Columbus, Ohio, and across 188 nations worldwide. This is Get Rich Education. We're having my favorite guest on the show today because that guest is you. I'm here with your listener questions. The first one concerns a kid's school report card, and then the rest are about real estate investing. Rebecca from Los Angeles, California asks, Keith, What reward should I give to my 11-year-old son, Mason, for having a good report card at school? He's got all A's and B's. I love your show. Keep up the great work. Well, thanks, Rebecca. I love this question. Even though we're largely a real estate investing show, I think there can be so many lessons about life for your 11-year-old son, Mason, here. The reward you can give him for his good report card is cash. Tell Mason that he's getting $100, or maybe it's $40, but in any case, let's just stick with the $100 example divided in half. Tell him that he's getting $50 in cash and tell Mason that as a bonus for later, another $50 is going to be invested for him. Now, over time, Mason will probably see that the invested $50 grew and the $50 that he spent on video games or whatever did not. But see, he still gets rewarded with short-term fun, and that way it's not all delayed gratification. As you know, the abundance mentality isn't about the eithers in life or the ors in life. It's about the ands. This way he can have his cake and eat it too. And right, what good is cake if you can't eat it? Now, I didn't say, note, that he had to spend the $50 cash part of this $50 gets invested, and you'll have the fun of keeping Mason updated on his invested portion over time, but he can do whatever he wants with that $50 cash part. And over time, if he sees the invested portion gain value, he might choose to actually invest some or all of the $50 cash rewards over time as well. But for now, let's be realistic. He wants to spend his $50 cash on Minecraft or Fortnite or the latest iteration of Grand Theft Auto, a video game like that, perhaps. That's fine. You need to let him be rewarded now because that might incentivize more near term good school performance, which is what you value seeing in Mason and invest that money pretty conservatively, too. So you're pretty sure that it is going to grow so that we'll get to see that growth. Thanks for the question, Rebecca. Now, before I move on to the next question, there's, I think, A real extrapolation here for you, the adult listener, with the way I recommended that Mason's report card could be rewarded. Really, there's a real estate investing lesson here. Mason gets rewarded both now and later. An employer sponsored retirement plan punishes you now by reducing your salary and make you delay gratification. Real estate investing, you could say that reduces your salary now in a way when you make your down payment, but it begins returning that to you in the form of cash flow now, and it gives you the long-term asset appreciation for later. 
As you know, I am definitely not in love with this popular term, delayed gratification. Now, I do think that there is a little something good to be said for it. I mean, look, when I made my first ever property, that fourplex building where I lived in one unit and rented out the other three, I could have bought a nicer single family home instead. So I delayed some gratification there. But I see some people and investors buy in to delayed gratification so much that I wonder how long their postponement of happiness is going to go on and if they'll even ever find it. And you know, it's sad to say, but sometimes people get shocking reminders of this, but then they quickly forget it afterward. I know this hits close to home for an Angelino like you, Rebecca, but you think about 41-year-old Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna being taken away from the world a few weeks ago. There are really all kinds of analogies for life here in this because sometimes later becomes never and you can't take that chance. Would you say that if 11-year-old Mason spent half his report card reward, the cash half, if he spent it all on video games, would you say that he blew that money or that he wasted that money? Maybe it could. I don't know. What about you, the adult listener? Sometimes I hear people say that you should save all of your money and not, quote, blow it on a vacation. As if you squandered money somehow if you went on vacation, I guess that could be true, but I don't know if that's necessarily true. I mean, look, what is money for? What if you've wanted to travel to the beautiful Croatian coast or see glaciers in Greenland? How can a person say that you're necessarily blowing your money if you go out and do that? You're getting out and seeing the very world that you live in. You're living the life you've dreamed of. I mean, why would you design your life to do any less than that? But see, I think most people, they just don't have a vehicle. They don't know about a durable, reliable vehicle like real estate that pays them in so many ways, both today and tomorrow. See, a lot of investment promoters, they want you to delay gratification. They oversell that stance. They're being selfish. They want you to invest your money with them so that they get the sale first and that they get the commission first and that they get the referral fee first. They've convinced you that paying yourself first actually means investing with them first so you can accumulate dollars in an account with your name on it so that you can only then consume it in distant years or in decades. Using your dollars in distant years or decades, well, then that's not paying yourself first. How did that ever get to be paying yourself first? Well, it's because that promoter or salesperson is really only thinking of themselves first. So there is something to be said for delayed gratification, yes, but delayed gratification should not be this permanent condition. I mean, what are you really going to start living the life that you've always wanted? The year 2052? Or do you have a plan instead to compound your cash flows so that you can do those things you wanted to do in, say, three years? You know that that's really the big reason, the number one reason for me that I don't care for conventional retirement plans. They only invest for later instead of both now and later, like cash flowing real assets do. Now, I don't think that you're going to find it self-redeeming if you live totally for today and you go broke trying to look rich with ostentatious displays and classic car status symbols like getting a Lambo. Unless that is indeed sustainable for you, then that's great. So be gratified both now and later. Give Mason cash half now, half turned into an investment that you make for him. And to 11-year-old Mason, if you listen to this now, I know you might want all 100 bucks right now. Most 11-year-olds would. I would have. Mason, if you listen to this show in 2030, when you're age 21, you still might not understand. If you listen to this in 2040, when you're age 31, it'll probably all make sense. Thanks for the question about your son, Mason, Rebecca. The next question comes from Gerald in Oxnard, California. And that is just up the 405 and 101 west from L.A., where our last listener inquiry was from. I went through Oxnard in my last drive from L.A. to Santa Barbara. Gerald writes in, Keith, thanks for your show. Nobody anywhere makes real estate investing more clear. It's my favorite 40 minutes of the week. 
Wow. Now, see, with a comment like this, it really increases your chances that I'm going to read your question on air here. Thanks, Gerald from Oxnard. He asks, you discuss the importance of multiple income streams. How proven do you think that real estate income streams are long term? How do I know it will still perform as an asset class for me in 30 years? Thanks for the question, Gerald. No one truly knows the future, but I know I've discussed elsewhere that people are going to keep needing a place to live like they have for centuries or even millennia now, and that inflation is the long-term trend and your long-term friend for a leveraged real estate investor. It's also what makes your cash flow rise faster than inflation since rents move up with inflation, but your principal and interest cost doesn't. It stays fixed. So I'm going to take this in a different direction, Gerald. You're asking about the reliability and durability of real estate as an asset class. And I think it's a good question. I recently had another listener write into me about a concept that I've thought about it before, but I never heard this articulated in such an elegant way. And I'm sorry that I don't remember this listener's name, but she wrote in and referred to real estate investing as packaged commodities investing. I love this ingenious thought of packaged commodities investing. When you buy a rental home or any home, yes, you're buying the cost of the utility and the construction labor, sure. But think about those materials in that home that you own, those commodities. You now own brick and lumber, glass, copper wire, styrofoam insulation, paint, ceramic, granite, oil in the roof shingles, masonry, concrete, rebar. You own an HVAC system. Every one of these individual commodity components are hedges against inflation. Now, Gerald, a while ago, Reddit had a trending article over these do-it-yourself houses that Sears used to sell over 100 years ago. And look, this is fascinating. I've got this one-page ad in front of me here. It looks like an old newspaper ad. It's for Sears Roebuck & Company from the year 1913. So this ad that's more than 100 years old is interesting to any investor or economist or marketer or everyday person even this ad is for like a kit you can buy where you help construct the home. Let me read it to you. It says, by allowing a fair price for labor, cement, brick, and plaster, which we, Sears, do not furnish, this house can be built for about $1,530, including all material and labor. Now, this looks like a small single-family home plan that Sears was offering you here back in 1913. I can't quickly find the square footage on it. Say it was 1,500 square feet. So you're buying this house over 100 years ago, new construction, for, say, a dollar per square foot then. They show you the flooring layout plan here in the ad, and this is a livable-looking space complete with a nice wide porch. It's not a tiny home. and. Uh, this is so quaint. The Sears ad goes on to say for $872, okay, which is more than half of your all-in cost of $1,500 that I mentioned, we will furnish all of the material to build this six-room bungalow consisting of millwork, siding, flooring, ceiling, finishing lumber, building paper, pipe, gutter, sash weights, hardware, painting material, lumber, lath, and shingles. And then they have the words, no extras in all caps. And then it says, we can guarantee enough material at this $872 price to build this house according to our plans. So that was $872 for the material. And then remember, your all-in price with labor and everything else is $1,530. This home that's giving us some historical commodity and real estate pricing perspective here, it does not look like a piece of junk. Reading on here, the large porch is sheltered by the projection of the upper story and supported with massive built-up square columns, a unique triple window in the attic, and fancy leaded art glass windows 
add much to this pleasing design. <laughs> That's all that I'll read from the ad here. So I think this is representative of this concept of packaged commodities investing that a listener introduced me to. It tells us a lot about monetary inflation, and at the same time, it speaks to the reliability and durability of residential real estate as an investment. Now, this is less sexy to think about than the five ways you're paid for sure. We're just looking at an element of durability here. When you have direct ownership of rental property, you simultaneously own all of these vital commodities. You own a basket of products. You'll see this Sears ad linked in the show notes. It's fascinating to see. And now back here in 2020, a lot of home construction, it's still largely done the same way it was done decades ago. 3D printed homes are not being adopted into the mainstream. Now, if they do, that could lower labor costs. You'd still need to add a lot of things to make a 3D printed residence a livable place more than a shell. You need components and penetrations and mechanicals and all those commodities that we've mentioned. Plus, you've got the cost of land that this entire thing is sitting on top of. Decently located land, that's a commodity in itself, and it's of limited supply. And by the way, Get Rich Education is a learning show, and the first definition of the word commodity, when I Google it, is this. A raw material or primary agricultural product that can be bought and sold, such as copper or coffee. That definition is from Oxford. Uh, they even have copper as the first example, and you expect to own copper with each home that you buy, just a little piece of it. I think yet another angle to your question, Gerald, about the durability of where your income stream comes from is the fact that we focus on residential properties here, and we always have. As the office and retail real estate sectors keep feeling pain, residential has become even more important all this time, and you already know all those reasons. More people can work from home, order products from home, and do more from home than they've ever done before. Now, Airbnb properties, they might work in the short run, but we haven't yet seen what happens to those type of properties in a recession yet. And as we know, the short-term rental market, that caters to business travelers and vacationers, and those segments are vulnerable in a real estate downturn. And durability is what you need your income stream to have. So that's why, for reliability reasons, I favor long-term residential real estate investing above all else. And I love to consider the elegance of this packaged commodities investing. Thanks for the great question, Gerald from Oxnard, California. The next question comes from Andrew in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Keith, I have been listening to your podcast for a while. Your mindset resonates with mine. I am a small animal veterinarian. I own and run my own small animal hospital. Well, that's cool. On the investment side, I have a balanced Wall Street portfolio, stock, bond, mutual funds. On the real estate side, I have a $280 cash flowing SFR. I take that to mean a $280 per month cash flowing single family rental. And I am involved in some multifamily syndications. I wrestle with buying more single family rental properties versus more syndications. I feel that since money is so cheap in today's economic climate, there is not much room for appreciation when buying real estate. Should I sit on the sidelines and wait? And then he puts in parentheses, wait for blood in the streets. He goes on to say, I like the Tampa area, but go back and forth with my thought process. I look forward to hearing you. Signed, Andrew. He shows his last name, comma, DVM. DVM is Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, by the way. Yeah, it is interesting that I've noticed a good deal of doctors and dentists listen to Get Rich Education, Andrew, but I doubt that it's number one. Anecdotally, I've noticed that for some reason, we seem to have a really high proportion of listeners that are in law enforcement, like police officers and such. Thanks for the question, Andrew, veterinarian from Connecticut. On the first part of your question, buying more single family rentals versus real estate syndications, that has a lot to do with your risk tolerance and your desire for passivity. Direct investing, like turnkey investing, it does require a little remote administration, even when you're not the property manager. 
but you've typically got higher returns and more control versus a syndication. In many cases, direct investing and that great control actually means you're more liquid with your funds. You're not super liquid, but you could sell in a few months if you had to. And with syndications, if you're in year two of an apartment syndication where it's seven years until that deal matures, and maybe you don't even like how the deal is going, well then, good luck getting your money out. You cannot access it. So those are some more of the trade-offs between direct investing and syndications. I know I've talked about that elsewhere. I know you wrote that money is still cheap, meaning that interest rates are low and you think that might be an indicator, perhaps, that appreciation in housing has run its course. Well, I'm still buying direct property where I own the deed. See, interest rates have basically been low for over a decade and we've had appreciation the entire time. Let's look more recently. In 2018, a couple years ago, interest rates really began a march higher And there were some people predicting that it would make housing prices go down. I said on the air at that time that I didn't think it would, and it didn't. In 2018, national appreciation rates were about 7%. In 2019, mortgage interest rates went lower and depreciation went lower down to about a 5% annual gain. So not as much appreciation with lower interest rates. Now, yes, there is a lag effect between mortgage interest rates and pricing as well, but mortgage interest rates, they're just one of, oh, at least 10 different macro factors that affect the price of housing. So a rate doesn't necessarily lead to a price increase or decrease. There might be more substantial housing factors skewing the numbers than interest rates. Housing prices, they can be affected by things like chronically low supply, like we've got today wage growth, job growth, in-migration, birth rates, death rates, and did lending requirements get more stringent or more lax? Did credit score requirements get more stringent or more lax? And on and on. But you do ask a good question, Andrew. If I didn't think it were good, I wouldn't be answering it here. Now, I know that you did not bring up the word bubble, but a few weeks ago, I described why I don't think we're in a real estate bubble. Prices are sustainable for an awful lot of reasons. But on the flip side, I don't see any scenario in which real estate nationally hits any high-flying annual appreciation rates like 10% or 12% or more anytime soon, kind of like we saw back in 2005. Low supply, that can only push prices so high. Affordability, that's the component that governs and tempers the upward price escalation. Affordability is what's moderating the rate of appreciation right now. Of course, whenever we talk about the future, no one really knows what's going to happen. These are just my thoughts and the basis and the reasoning for why I have them. And then you mentioned that you like Tampa. I do too. I really like so much of Florida. Of course, you've got to get your sub-market right. And I need to say that's generally Florida north of Miami because the numbers don't work so well for cash flow in South Florida. Around Miami, you just don't get a higher rent income proportionally to the much higher purchase prices there. Now think about this. When you look at net migration by state for last year, which is the latest year we have data for, Texas was second in the United States. They had a net in migration of 190,000 people. Florida, even though they have a smaller population than Texas, is number one with 322,000 positive net in migration. Yeah, 322,000 moving into a smaller state, Florida, and 190,000 into a larger population state, Texas. Florida has rent-to-value ratios that are favorable. And as an investor, your property tax rate is substantially lower in Florida than it is in Texas. Now, I'm not sour on Texas or anything. I'm just comparing Texas to Florida right now. There are a lot of reasons to like Tampa and like Florida. And of course, that's why we had our real estate field trip there last October in Tampa as well. Thanks for the question, Andrew. If you want to hear your voice on the show, ask your question at getricheducation.com slash contact. We get a lot of questions. There's certainly no guarantee I'm going to be able to answer yours. But I realized that on earlier listener question episodes, I had only left you with our mail address, so that's why I have mostly email questions today and only one voicemail question. 
I'd really prefer to hear your voice on the show. So by visiting getricheducation.com slash contact, that way you'll have the option of either leaving a voicemail or an email, whatever you prefer there. Two more listener questions today. What should you do first, pay off your student loan debt or invest? And I need to tell you why you should always get a property inspection before you buy a property. And one other crucial thing before you buy a property that you may not have ever thought about before, that's next. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Countless property investors get killed with maintenance costs, but that's far less likely when you buy brand new construction. Let me tell you about JWB Real Estate Capital in Jacksonville, Florida. They pioneered the build-to-rent model where you can invest in new construction turnkey rental properties. That's why JWB was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. To learn more and see inventory, go to newconstructionturnkey.com. The company that's provided our listeners with more loans than anyone is Ridge Lending Group, NMLS 42056. You can finance more than 10 single families up to fourplexes. Serving most U.S. states, their knowledge and experience leads to your financial freedom. They're number one in the investment space. Pre-qualify and then chat with President Chaley Ridge personally. Start on your next investment property loan right now at RidgeLendingGroup.com. This is the Real Wealth Network's Kathy Fetchy, and you are listening to the always valuable Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Hey, you're back inside Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, answering your listener questions today. The next question comes from Dylan in Nebraska. I'm not sure which Nebraska place he's from. Let's play the audio. Hey, Keith, I had a question about student debt. Say someone has $200,000 in debt from student debt. I know you said that is bad debt. So I was wondering what your opinion is on if doing like the 20 year fixed due to the inflation hedging benefits or trying to pay that bad debt off as quickly as possible before starting real estate. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dylan. And I do consider student loan debt as bad debt. Yeah, because you have to pay it back yourself. That is, you can't directly outsource those payments to someone else like you can with your mortgage payment to tenants in a rental property where they pay all of your mortgage interest, all of your mortgage principal, and hopefully another couple hundred dollars on top of that called cash flow. Not to mention, Congress passed an act in 2005, and that made student loans quite difficult to discharge in bankruptcy. With your question, Dylan, basically being, should I pay off 200 k in student loan debt as quickly as possible before starting real estate investing? Well, the answer, as it often is, is it depends. But I'll tell you what it depends on. The short answer is if your real estate cash-on-cash return could beat the interest rate on your student loan debt, only then would you invest in real estate and make the minimum student loan debt payment. Now, that was really good insight on the inflation hedging in your question there, or maybe the inflation profiting that long-term debt can provide you. I can tell that you're a careful listener to the show, Dylan. Of course, that's just one tailwind, just one consideration. And the reason why inflation profiting is lower in priority than your cash on cash return is that you need liquidity. You need cash to service your student loan debt. I don't know what your student loan debt interest rate is, but let's just say you're paying a 6% interest rate on that debt. Now, yes, I understand that it's really easy to look at the five ways that real estate pays you and think, oh, come on, I can get a 20% or perhaps a 30%, 40%, maybe even a 50% ROI when I buy right. So I'm just going to then pay the minimum on the student loan and plow all of the extra into real estate. You know, to that, I would say not so fast, even though that might very well work out for you. We need to be more conservative because real estate appreciation isn't liquid Tenant-made loan amortization isn't liquid, and neither are real estate's tax benefits or the aforementioned inflation profiting. So to use the simplest example, 
If your rental gives you just $100 of monthly cash flow, which is $1,200 annually, and you've got 20 k of skin in the game on your rental as a down payment and closing cost, well, that $1,200 of annual cash flow that you have divided by your 20 k down payment is 6%. $1,200 divided by 20 k That's your cash-on-cash cash return portion. And if you can get that at 6% or above, then reduce your student loan paydowns dollar per dollar for every dollar that you instead put into real estate. That's really the upshot there. And yes, there are some smaller things to consider. Last time I checked, student loan interest in the United States is a tax deduction of up to $2,500 annually. So your 6% interest rate might effectively be five, five and a half or whatever it is. Understand the risk. You don't want to be left cash poor. Your total rate of return on real estate, yes, it's almost certainly going to be your student loan interest rate, but that's not enough. Let's be conservative. So to summarize, because you service loan debt with cash, not equity, student loan debt, or any other type of debt, the key question you need to ask yourself is, am I confident that my cash on cash return from real estate will exceed the interest rate on the student loan debt or whatever other type of debt that you have? If your answer to this key question that I just asked, if that's yes, then invest in real estate and stretch out the student loan and only pay the minimum on the student loan. Otherwise, you are walking away from an arbitrage opportunity. If the answer is no, then retire the student loan debt balance sooner. Otherwise, then you are hemorrhaging cash. Now, what did I personally do in my life? After college, I retired my student loan debt fairly promptly, but this is before I knew about real estate investing. Back then, I still thought that budgets were good and that the best way to financial betterment was cutting expenses, and I thought all of the wrong stuff back then. That was an awesome question, Dylan in Nebraska, because I know that so many people have that question. That question is basically, how do I best allocate a dollar toward debt retirement versus expanding my upside? The next question is from Monique in Quebec City, Quebec. Monique says, Keith, I love your show. I've listened to every new episode since 2018, and now I'm also going back and listening to them from the beginning. Thanks, Monique. Gosh, I'm grateful for your listenership. Monique goes on to say, I've bought four cash flowing properties from the providers at greturnkey.com. Good job there, Monique. They were all existing construction properties. Though I expect less cash flow on my fifth one because it's going to be a brand new construction property, I wonder, is the home inspection a required expense for me when the property is completely new? Thanks for all your help. Signed, Monique. Monique, the answer is yes, you should. Always have a pre-purchase inspection done even for a new construction property. Sometimes people think of a new construction property as perfect. And I don't think of any property as perfect, but an example of a mistake made in a new construction property when your builder has built it is maybe the air conditioner is too small and doesn't have the capacity to cool all 1,800 square feet of the home or whatever the footage is. Maybe some brand new flooring wasn't installed correctly and it's showing signs of delamination. So an inspection provided by a local independent third-party inspector in that area, that's a cheap insurance policy for you, the buyer. And you need to factor that in as one of your closing and due diligence costs. All in, your closing and due diligence costs are usually about 4% of the purchase price. Now, an inspection on a single-family rental, typically, it's probably going to cost you somewhere in the neighborhood of $400. Of course, that'll vary based on the area. You have the inspection performed shortly after you and your seller provider agree on a purchase and sale contract. The reason that you want to get the inspection scheduled quite promptly after you're in contract is because sometimes it can take a while, a week or weeks sometimes, for your provider's contractor to fix the deficiencies that your inspector ends up finding on the property that you plan to buy. Now, how do you find an inspector for your property anyway? Well, there are a few ways of going about it. You can ask your provider to recommend one, but if you're leery of that or you think your provider might be in cahoots somehow with the inspector, secondly, you could Google your own. 
Or thirdly, get an opinion from friends, or if you don't have friends that have invested there before, then use an online real estate forum to ask your question. Seek an inspector that's ASHI certified, A-S-H-I, that stands for American Society of Home Inspectors, and those certificates, they are educated, tested, verified, and certified. And the inspections that they do for you really are quite thorough. It's really a good deal for you. The inspector goes everywhere in the home you're planning to purchase. They'll even walk around the yard. Inside the home, I mean, they look everywhere, in the closets, in every pantry, making sure all the doors and the windows open and close. Down below, if there's a crawl space, they'll climb down into that space looking for deficiencies. They're taking notes, they're taking photos, and then they compile that in a report and they send it to you. Before you buy the property, as part of this inspection, the inspector might even go up on the roof or at least zoom in from the ground. They'll take some photos of the roof. And of course, they go all through the home and check everything in between. And they do the entire inspection same day. It takes them a couple hours. Now, some common findings that your property inspector might have are things like the outdoor rainwater downspout discharges water at the foundation, and we'll recommend that extensions are added. That's a super cheap, easy fix for your seller to do for you. The kitchen window doesn't close all the way because it has a broken crank. The exhaust fan in the bathroom doesn't have any power and it's not pulling any air. The outdoor water spigot is missing its valve. The back door is bent at the bottom. A porch this high off the ground needs to have a railing added. So, Monique, as you can see, some of these are deficiencies that could occur in a new construction home. Now, let me touch on a couple of these. The back door is bent. That's something that could be pretty minor. If you don't think it's aesthetically distracting and the door still closes, then maybe you do ask the provider to fix it, and maybe you don't. If I were you, I'd usually just ask. But if there's a minor dent in the door instead and it still functions well, then asking for something like replacing the entire door, that could make you appear to the seller is kind of unreasonable to deal with. There's some judgment there. But if the back door won't close, you've got to at least see that it closes and latches properly or the seller needs to make sure that happens. The last example I mentioned there, if the inspector cites a finding that a porch this high off the ground needs to have a railing for safety, you've got to be sure that that's done. In fact, a reputable provider is going to be sure that that's done for you. Now, this is part, Monique, it's part of you being a good operator. Remember how I've discussed elsewhere that having an LLC is not as important as some people think. It's only perhaps your fourth line of protection. Make sure any health or safety findings are addressed from the inspection. So we're doing that good in the world that we want to do out there. And if an accident ever did occur at the property, you can always point to the inspection that you had done, and it was an option that you chose to pay for because the inspection is your option. So these are all the findings that the inspector reports to you, and he'll send you a report of a few dozen pages in a PDF format. Some things might be noted in the report, but the inspector won't list them necessarily as deficiencies that must be remedied, maybe something minor like small cracks in the sidewalk. Often in the report, the inspector makes a clear delineation as to when a condition is poor enough such that it falls to a deficient level, and he puts those deficiencies all in one punch list at the end of the report. And that way you're not having to split hairs and do too much interpretation yourself in the report and what's really a problem and what isn't. So you look the report over and then you ask the seller to fix them for you before you go ahead and close on the property. And the provider might take, say, a week or more to have their contractor fix those punch listed items. Sometimes it's done sooner. When they finish those, well, now you're on your way to having your appraisal and moving closer to the closing table. But I've got to tell you something kind of disappointing here. I have been directly investing in real estate actively and continuously since 2002. And I've got to tell you, many times, even when the contractor says they've completed fixing everything on that inspection punch list, they might even send you pictures afterward. Something really wasn't quite fixed right. 
So what I suggest is that existing construction or new construction, when you hire your inspector, tell him right then and there that you are also going to want a follow-up re-inspection that occurs after the initial inspection. And I think so many people overlook this before they buy a property. The purpose of a re-inspection is confirming that all of the deficiencies noted in the original inspection were indeed done. And by the way, there will always be original inspection findings. An inspector will always find at least one deficiency. And I've dealt with properties from Pennsylvania to Florida to Alaska to Texas and in between and outside the U.S. too. Inspectors always find stuff that's wrong. Always. It's like a universal law. But getting back to re-inspections, upon scheduling your original home inspection, if you point out at that time that you'll also be getting a re-inspection later, tell both the inspector and the seller this. And I tend to think that it helps keep parties on their toes and that they try harder to then get the original inspection findings handled the first time. And look, re-inspections are super cheap. If a single family rental original inspection costs you $400, a re-inspection is usually going to be less than $100. I've even paid $50, $60 in some markets for the re-inspection. It is pretty hard to believe that you can even get a trained, qualified professional to make a field visit somewhere that inexpensively, but they really do that. Now, and I had this happen too, what if after your re-inspection, which would really be a second inspection then, that the provider or their contractor still didn't get things repaired properly? Then the responsibility shifts to your seller. Now it's up to them to schedule and pay for a second re-inspection, which would be a third inspection then to finally prove that it's right. That's correct. In every state and nation I've ever invested in, the seller side pays for your second re-inspection if it comes to that. And that's fair because after the original inspection findings, your seller said they'd make the repairs if the reinspection that you paid for to confirm that it was done instead shows that it wasn't done. Well, your seller had their chance and they messed it up. So that's why it's customary that they pay for the second reinspection. So, Monique, to summarize for you here, always pay for a property inspection, even on new construction. Expect there to be findings every time. And my own personal experience shows that at the time that you book an inspection, it helps to indicate that you will be getting a re-inspection too. Now, getting a re-inspection makes so much more sense, by the way, than getting a reappraisal. If you get a low appraisal, which doesn't happen often, maybe I'll discuss that another day. Reappraisals are almost always a waste of time. More than 95% of the time, they just come back with the same valuation that you got the first time. An appraisal protects the bank. An inspection protects you. So be sure to have one done. Excellent question, Monique from Quebec City, Canada. Next week on the show, I'm going to discuss real estate's secret market, a geography where the numbers really work for investors that might have been off your radar. After that, we're going to talk with a prominent economist that's never been on the show before that's going to help you see your economic future over the next one to three years. We've hosted a lot of economists here on the show that give you those long-term investing insights. People like Richard Duncan, Harry Dent, Jim Rickards, Jim Rogers, and also though they might not be economists, Robert Kiyosaki and Chris Martinson are here with us to give us those types of insights. And then there's yours truly. I'm your armchair economist with zero economics degree. But this new guest is the leader of the oldest continuously operating economics prediction company in the entire United States. So I'm excited to chat with him and bring you that show soon. As you know, nationally, housing inventory is scarce. And it's especially true with these types of single family homes that make the best rentals. And you can't make any money from the property that you don't own. So whether you prefer to call it Packaged commodities investing or the get paid up to five ways vehicle. Next time you're looking to connect with the provider at greturnkey.com, I can tell you lately that as we spoke of Florida earlier, you'll see that Jacksonville has brand new construction property where you're probably 
more a fan of appreciation than you are cash flow on those. Rents are $1,350 on a 180K purchase price. That's a 0.75 rent to value ratio. Tampa has existing construction property where you have a 0.8, maybe even a 0.85 ratio, and you might get, say, $150 of cash flow there. Alabama has numbers that work, like rent to value ratios near a full 1% and really low property taxes in either Birmingham or Huntsville. If you're looking for low cost property, as low as 80K, but yet still in decent enough neighborhoods that really cash flow well, Memphis and Little Rock could be the places for you. The Indiana State side of Chicagoland is advantageous too. All those places, Memphis, Little Rock, and Chicagoland, you can get a full 1% rent-to-value ratio or even more than that sometimes. And now, if you've got patience and you want to benefit and capture some of the forced equity along with your long-term cash flow, then the Burr model in Baltimore could work best for you. Check out all of those markets and more at greturnkey.com. Thank you. I am grateful for all of your excellent listener questions today. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.